Welcome to our webcast, Design and Deployment Best Practices for a Reliable Fiber Optic Network, sponsored by Panduit. Before we get into our main subject matter, let's begin by going over the viewer panel. If you've participated in earlier control engineering webcasts, you may have noticed that we're using a new platform, so here are some of its characteristics. First, make sure that your pop-up blocker is turned off. This is an option in your browser software. You can use the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen to type in questions for the speaker during the presentation for the Q&A session at the end. If you are on Twitter, you can tweet your questions to us during the webcast by using the following Twitter hashtag, Reliable Fiber Optic Network, all one word, no hyphens. You may ask us questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll get to as many as time allows. Questions that are for today's presenter will be answered verbally during the Q&A session at the end of the webcast. To download a presentation of the slides, use the event resources on the left side of your screen. To learn more about our sponsor, use the Sponsor tab on top of your screen or click on the logo at the bottom of your screen to be redirected to their website. This webcast is being recorded including the Q&A session at the end. We'll post the archive on the Control Engineering website in a few days, and we'll send you an email message with a link connecting directly to it. If you are having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to make before escalating to an online technician. If you're experiencing issues with your slide or audio, please refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's headshot. You can control the volume of uh, audio settings of the webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Question area on the left-hand side of your screen. Thank you to our expert presenter for this webcast. Robert Reed is a Senior Product Development Manager in the Fiber Products Division at Panduit Corporation, a global leader in network and electrical infrastructure solutions based in Tinley Park, Illinois. In this position, Robert defines his product development direction for Panduit's fiber optic structured cabling product line. He is also responsible for solutions and product development and product strategy for the industrial automation market. Robert has been active in fiber optics industry for over 25 years in the development of passive optical components, optoelectronic and specialty optics and systems. He has also participated in the development of many of the standard EIA-TIA fiber optic test procedures and has served as membership chair to the EIA-TIA fiber optic LAN section. I'm Mark Hosky, webcast moderator and content manager for Control Engineering since 1994. Please take a moment to remind yourself about dealing with technical issues during the presentation I'll give you a moment to review this slide before proceeding. Very good. And now, Robert. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Great introduction. Um, I'm Robert Reed. I'm the Senior Product Development Manager here at Panduit in the fiber group. I've been with Panduit for about 10 years and uh, been in the fiber optics industry for longer than I want to mention, but uh, served in a variety of functions, connector design, cable, fiber development, component uh, development, and so forth. Today we're going to talk about best practices in the uh, industrial automation space for uh, designing re reliable fiber optic networks. And in terms of an agenda, I'm going to give you a couple of roadmaps for a, a network from a reference architecture standpoint, a physical roadmap. I really want to key in on the cabling standards that 
they're around the fiber industry and some of the standards, one, one standard in particular that is a uh, industrial standard and how it keys into um, to the, the fiber uh, cabling. Uh, I'm going to build up a couple of use cases for fiber, and these will be spoken to from a standards perspective, from an architecture perspective. Um, long and storied um, history and enterprise, and these standards are, are from an enterprise perspective, but uh, are very useful uh, when we're talking about building uh, an industrial automation network. Uh, why fiber? So what I've built in here is a value proposition for fiber, speaking to its benefits over a copper solution. Obviously, everybody knows that a fiber solution is more expensive to deploy uh, component-wise and uh, total installed cost than a copper solution, but we'll talk about where you would deploy a fiber solution. I'm going to talk to the, the building blocks of uh, of a fiber network at the component level. We'll talk a little bit about transceivers, talk about some of the fiber types that are out there, the tra traditional fiber types, and a new fiber type that I'm going to introduce. It's a uh, very rugged, reliable fiber type. Talk about component selection, and end the presentation with um, a snapshot of best practices and looking at uh, how you'd certify a link. So without further ado, um, We'll talk to kind of the key elements of a um, network design for Ethernet, Ethernet IP. And we'll really focus on the bottom of this diagram, really where the, uh, the control network is, where we have that logo there, Ethernet IP. And we'll talk about these three uh, application areas. And they're kind of architected a little bit differently, working left to right. We've got a star network, a traditional star network, reaching out to different cells. The middle one is a resilient ring network, um, and the last one would be a linear bus or a star uh, topology. Uh, really, it's important to develop a logical roadmap, um, which, uh, you know, partnering with IT, you can uh, use the tools that are at hand uh, that are well developed for this reference architecture. And it's really important to, to use uh, industry standards, these reference models, and these reference architectures. You know, dialing it to uh, a physical cable plant uh, from this reference architecture, and this is just a, a high-level roadmap of a, a Ethernet IP physical cable plant. I'm going to start to talk about some of these acronyms that you'll see in the standards, a telecom enclosure, uh, a TR, a telecommunications rooms, pathways that are covered in different standards, uh, grounding and bonding, an equipment room that functions as a mini data center for the, uh, for the enterprise and for the, uh, for the industrial space, control panels, uh, pathways. And the, these, are, these are the elements of the physical cable plant that support uh, an industrial automation network. The key standard that governs it's at the top level is the telecommunications infrastructure standard for an industrial premises. Now this is a TIA standard. Uh, there is a group within TIA, TR42.9, TR uh, it's the Industrial Infrastructure Subcommittee. This is a fairly recent standard. Um, the ones that we really want to focus on for this presentation are the uh, telecommunication spaces. So that would be, you know, as an example, a telecommunication room, the telecommunication pathways, the backbone cabling, which is typically fiber in a in a uh, enterprise, the horizontal cabling, which is typically copper in an enterprise, uh, and the the cabling performance requirements that uh, really aren't espoused in this standard, but they refer to uh, other standards in TIA where you would pull out uh, the performance requirements on fiber cable components, as an example. So keying on, in on the, the standards that, uh, that are important coming off of that 1005 standard, uh, these are the common standards that uh, to build 
a cable plant, uh, you would start to look at, and working from top left to right, we have the, the TIA 568C.0. So that's a generic standard that talks about uh, what it takes in terms of uh, a cable plant, uh, the design of the cable plant, and definitions and so forth. TIA 569 pathways and spaces is important because we do have pay pathways for cable. It's important to understand uh, what cable is, is, is applicable for what pathway and so forth. But in terms of a, uh, the solution I'm going to show you here, the, a zone cabling solution that's kind of the uh, very cost-effective way to deploy cable plant, that is defined in 568 or 569 pathways and spaces. On the other side, we have TIA 568C.3. So this is the definition of really the fiber components that uh, constitute the cable plant. Um, so the, some of the components I'm going to go through, the optical fiber, connectors, and so forth that constitute the cable plant, that's where the expectations on those individual components is placed through that standard. Well, here we have a hierarchical star network uh, diagram. And it's, sorry, it's a little bit of an eye diagram, but if we take the 568C.0 standard and we peel that back, we will see an architecture that really constitutes, um, we've got an equipment room going out to multiple telecom rooms. Now, in an enterprise space, that this could be multiple floors and the standard speaks to a telecom room per floor as a minimum. In an industrial space, most, most times you're not going to have floors, but you might have one floor with multiple TRs. So typically, and I've, I've, co I've color-coded this, the orange would be, in most cases, fiber cable. And so what we have between a telecom room and an equipment room at the bottom is what we, we, we talk about a backbone, a fiber cable backbone. And those are typically multi-fiber distribution cables that would travel between two panels, patch panels. Uh, the equipment room houses in this two-layer network a core switch. The, e, the TRs, the telecom rooms, would house work group switches, smaller rack mount switches. Now, the blue represents the COP, what we call the horizontal cable subsystem. So, and typically we want to have a testable link, so we have copper patch panels in the TR, and we have outlets or patch panels near the control panels or in the control panels um, uh, to constitute uh, a horizontal link, and that's a testable, what we call permanent link per 568. The backbone cabling, the orange cabling between those two fiber panels, the one in the TR, and the one in the ER is also a permanent link, and that is testable. In terms of a industrial application, this is probably not the greatest solution because TRs uh, consume brick and mortar. Um, they can be very big. And one of, the, one of the things you might want to consider is breaking up that TR into multiple uh, TEs, which I'm showing here. So that gives you a lot more flexibility. Uh, so a TE is a telecom enclosure. So instead of that monolithic TR, the backbone on the left-hand side now goes from the ER, the equipment room, out to multiple TEs. And we're calling it generically fiber to the enclosure. So I would have a small patch panel inside of each one of these TEs. Uh, that would provide a testable link back to the equipment room, the patch panels there, and I would, I would have, I'd break up the cabling into smaller bite-sized chunks, so I'd have smaller fiber cables between the ERs and the TEs than I had in the previous case. And then again, we have in the blue, going out to these control panels, we have, again, a, a copper uh, permanent link. It's, albeit it's shorter, uh, which is a good thing because now these TEs, these small telecommunications enclosures, can live near 
the, these islands of automation, let's say, or these uh, the automation applications near the control panels. And this is nice because it's a quick install. It's very scalable. Uh, it limits risk. Of course, you've got a shorter length. Uh, but it's really a, a nice demarcation point between the business side, the IT side, and the factory automation side. So this, this, this enclosure um, functions as a demarcation point. Obviously, heat would be a concern. So you may have to have a fan on there, depending on the equipment that's in there, how many switches and so forth. Um, you need to secure these enclosures um, and so forth. But there is a limit on the number of drops per enclosure. Obviously, a large TR can service many, 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 many uh, applications, whereas these small TEs uh, would have to be sized to these little islands of automation. And if, you, if you look at this, this is a great application for automation because you don't have to, as automation moves, uh, Product lines come and go. Uh, these are easily reconfigurable, whereas a, a monolithic brick and mortar te telecommunications room uh, may not be uh, the best solution on day two when uh, the automation moves or the, uh, the jobs come and go, equipment changes. Um, we can take the same approach, this uh, TE approach, into uh, rep ring design. So what I've done here is basically, and I'll toggle back and forth between these two slides, I've got the same zone approach where I'm zoning the cabling into these little enclosures. But now what I've done, instead of starring out to these enclosures, these TEs, what I've done is I've kind of closed the loop. So I've actually ha I actually have a ring network. So what I can do is the, uh, the mini switches that are in these uh, TEs, or if they're not mini switches, if it's a, uh, like a pizza box switch, I can take the uplink um, from one side and put it into the next switch and basically form these switches in a ring. And the beauty of that is if I have a uh, power outage on one of these, um, on one of these little uh, zones of automation, if the power to the TE goes down, I still have comms everywhere else. I still have communication between the remaining TEs. So this is resilient. This is network resilient. Um, just to show you an example of this is a, a TE that's housing a single switch. I think this is an Allen Bradley for 5700 Rockwell uh, Automation 5700 switch mounted on, a, D ra on a, a DIN rail. And what I've got here is I've got a fiber coming in on the left-hand side through a distribution cable terminated in a patch box that sits up on the rail. And then I've got a, uh, so working backwards to that equipment room, I've got a testable permanent link of fiber. And now I have a patch facility to patch into the switch uh, with the fiber. And on the right-hand side of the switch, I have the same patch box, but now it's servicing copper. And it's servicing the copper horizontal that's going out to the control panels. And there, also, I have, would have a testable link because I have a, uh, a patch panel potentially on both sides, so I can test that as permanent infrastructure. A lot of acronyms here, but all of these acronyms are uh, noted in the 568 standard or the 569 standard. Hierarchical STAR, we talked about that. That's a STAR network that, uh, that is covered in that uh, 568C.0 standard. Um, probably not the optimal uh, architecture for an industrial network. Um, fiber to the enclosure, this is actually mostly covered in the pathways and spaces spec, the 569 spec. Uh, very cost effective, um, and we'll talk about this later, but there is actually a cost model to compare these type of architectures, this zone, active zone, fiber to the enclosure architecture versus a hierarchical star architecture. Uh, so the terms, the, uh, the telecom enclosure, uh, there's also terms like consolidation point, that would be like a a passive zone approach where I just have the, the large cable broken down into multiple smaller cables, uh, MUDO or MUTOA, multiple user 
telecommunications outlet. That's another uh, term that is in the um, in the 569 standard, and that is uh, that is another term for a, a kind of a consolidation point where I have multiple user outlets from one big cable being broken broken down into uh, multiple cables in one space. Uh, the active devices in the zone are beyond 568C.0, and as I mentioned, they're in 569. We give some, Panduit gives some, some uh, guidance in our fiber optic uh, infrastructure application guide. Uh, this is a guide that uh, was jointly built by Rockwell Automation, Cisco Systems, and Panduit. Great guide. It's uh, 70 or 80 pages. A lot of the content that's in this presentation is really expanded on in that guide. So I recommend you, and we'll give you a link to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, converged uh, plant-wide Ethernet implementation guide, another great guide, Rockwell, and Autom Rockwell Automation and Cisco system, sy Systems. So these tools are out there. We'll talk a little bit more at the end of the presentation on where to get your hands on those. I wanted to mention cost-effectiveness of fiber to the enclosure because I think it's important. Um, it's uh, very cost ineffective to build telecom rooms in light of the fact of a, you have a highly dynamic manufacturing environment and equipment comes and goes and things get reconfigured and so forth. So there's a real value proposition to this fiber to the enclosure active zone approach. Now one of the tools that's out there that compares architectures, the uh, hierarchical star in particular to these fiber to the enclosure designs is actually developed by TIA. Uh, there's, a, there's a group out there called the, the Fiber Optic Land Section under TIA, and you can go out to the website. I believe it's fols.org, and they have a freely downloadable uh, cost model. There's a companion guide for its use. It has a full bill of materials, all the active gear, uh, all of the cable infrastructure included uh, in this model. And what it does is it gives a, uh, it's not a design tool, but it's a what-if tool. What if I implemented fiber to the enclosure versus a uh, hierarchical star network? How much would I save? So I'm just pointing this out. This is a very uh, highly downloaded from the fiber optic land section. In fact, I think fiber optic land section is now the fiber optic technology consortium, but you can get to it through fols.org. I highly recommend you go out there and play around with this tool. Uh, it's, it's a great thing to prove the, uh, the total installed cost of a fiber to the enclosure solution over a star, a hierarchical star uh, network. So why fiber? Why would you use fiber? So there is guidance uh, in some of the Rockwell Automation, uh, this is from Plant PAX uh, Process Automation System Guide. Um, why would you use fiber? Um, fiber uplinks, uh, higher bandwidth capability, future proofing capability. Uh, there are fiber networks now that support 40 and 100 gig. Uh, future proofing is important. Getting fiber closer to the application to future proof. Uh, at extended lengths, this, this provides solutions beyond 100 meters uh, is the limitation of copper. We have solutions that are tens of kilometers. Uh, a 10 100 multi-mode low-cost fiber solution goes out to two kilometers. Another thing is uh, convergence time. If I break a leg of the network uh, in a ring, let's say, how long does it take to recover? So this might be important in a, in a uh, machine uh, movement, you know, motion control. It might be a safety issue, uh, security issues, uh, noise issues. Fiber is intrinsically immune to both uh, EMP and EMI. Fiber is not the transceivers. That's a misconception. The fiber transceivers are electronics. They are still susceptible. Just the physical benefits uh, in terms of the components, uh, benefits of fiber in an industrial space, outside plant capabilities. We have a thing called uh, a Verizon Fios today that lives in the outside plant. These are solutions that are harsh environment. 
So there are a, a, a myriad of solutions for fiber that can be placed in an extreme environment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about mice environments later on in the presentation with respect to uh, cable selection. The flame ratings are important. We need to talk about that. Riser, plenum spaces, uh, outdoor transition spaces, uh, low smoke zero halogen. So this is a concern when you buy uh, a cable to meet the regulations of the locality. Uh, armored fiber, you know, uh, rodent proof, uh, uh, collision proof fiber, you know, uh, you want to reduce the probability that the fiber will be cut especially a fiber that is close to the business network that carries more traffic. Um, you have to be uh, cognizant of the spaces that these fibers live in for future proofing, uh, fill ratios, um, and so forth. Now, fiber does provide a smaller footprint than copper, typically, uh, so you get better um, you know, packing in a, in a, in a space, um, but we have to be cognizant of these things. Again, dialing it back to a, an application space for fiber cable and, and highlighting where these uh, applications might live. Uh, working left to right, we're working from the business side of things right down to the application. So as we progress from left to right, and these are Panduit terms that we use in room, in route, in panel, in field. You're working from a higher level enterprise network all the way down to a uh, device network. And there's multiple solutions that can be deployed in terms of the connectivity, in terms of the fiber cable, all the way along this, uh, this route. I did want to talk a little bit about the electronics. And this is as deep as I'll get. But typically, the fiber lives on the uplink side of a switch. Um, this is a DIN rail mounted switch. It's a Stratix 1800. I think it's kind of the flagship of uh, Rockwell's product line. But this switch here has two uplinks in a small form factor uh, uh, MSA, Manufacturer Supply Agreement. It's a standard form factor for a pluggable transceiver. And you will see that there are two ports on the front of the uh, transceiver. One is a receive, one's a transmit. So this is a duplex link. And the reason we would have two uplinks Again, to provide network resiliency, if you're going out star, you would have two links to this switch. Uh, if one were to go down, transceiver were to fail, fiber get cut, you'd still have communications out to the switch. In a ring network, you could have uh, the fiber cable coming in from one side plugged into one transceiver, and then the fiber uh, going out on the other side to another switch, and continuing that in a, in a ring pattern wanted to give you a little bit of detail, a lot of words in this, but I'll try to shortcut the words. So we have a, a uh, modular transceiver that was shown on the previous slide, and it has a media device interface. Uh, so that is the receptacle. This is a very common transceiver. So if, if you do one gig, uh, this is pretty much it de facto. Any one gig transceiver is pretty much this form factor, this small form factor pluggable. And by default, uh, we have a, a lot of acronyms again, a FOCUS 10 LC connector. So I have a, a very small form factor uh, fiber optic connector intermediability standard. That's another TIA standard that defines the, uh, the mating uh, compatibility between connectors so that manufacturer A's connector would uh, mate with manufacturer B's adapter or uh, transceiver. There are a couple of standards, communication standards, IEEE, that I want to key in on. Uh, this is the most important one. This, this is the 1000 uh, base SX. So this is a one gig. Uh, transceiver that goes out to, uh, depending on the fiber type, 275 meters, 550 meters, depending on the bandwidth of the fiber. One of the things I want to talk about is we have to be careful of the power budget, and I'll get into that in a minute. I'm going to scan through these slides fairly quickly here. 
Um, so what we can talk about is three different types of fiber, 62 and a half, 50, and we can talk about an optimized 50 um, uh, micron fiber. And we have three different reaches. We have 275 meters, we got 550 meters, we got 800 meters, depending on the fiber type, the bandwidth of the fiber. So these things are typically designed with a certain amount of connector loss in the channel. So these are designed at 1.5 dB of connector loss in the channel. So I've got two fiber types there. I've got an OM1 fiber, which is a 62.5, and, and I've got an OM2 fiber, which is a 50 micron. So you can see the design points for IEEE, 275 meters and 550 meters. That's not to say that I couldn't have them. So what we want to talk about is connector loss in the channel. And what I'm saying is it's not hard and fast at a uh, dB and a half, and we can affect reach as a function of the connector loss. So that's the, that's the message of this slide. Um, fiber media. So mainly the message here is that the low-cost media is graded in terms of its bandwidth. There's a OM1, an OM2, and an OM3. So it's really important to specify the bandwidth and the reach and selecting that fiber is also, also plays into the future proofing of the fiber. We talked about uh, convergence time. Um, distance is, is important. I mean, as I mentioned before, we've got solutions that go two kilometers out to multiple tens of kilometers. We want to avoid single mode if we can avoid it. Uh, single mode is mainly a tens of kilometer solutions. The electronics are very expensive. So the discussion is really about multi-mode uh, fiber solutions and multi-mode um, connectivity. Very briefly, key fiber characteristics, geometry, single mode, we won't talk too much about that. Multi-mode, the two main types, OM1, 62 and a half as a core, that's where the, the light transmits through, and 125 as a cladding. 50-125 is an OM2, an OM3, an OM4 fiber. I won't go too much into this, but we have multiple standards that cover the definitions of these fibers, uh, 62 and a half, 50. The main message here is that these are graded by their bandwidth capability. So each one of these transceivers that you would use, like an SX transceiver, depending on the fiber that you put in there, Depending on the fiber that you put in there, you affect a different reach. So dialing it back to the reference architecture, um, we've got three different areas. I'm only going to talk about two of these, but we've got um, the backbone cabling system. So this would come from your micro data center out to your zone enclosures, your TEs. And you've got a myriad of choices here depending on uh, the environment. So going from top to bottom, the yellow cabling, down to the bottom is really in terms of their uh, robustness. So you've got armored uh, cable, which would be rodent-proof, crush-resistant, all the way down to standard distribution cable, which would have to be laid in a protected pathway. So here's a snapshot of an armored cable, metallic interlock. So you really don't need to run a separate pathway with this cable. It can be basically a single pull. Normally, if you're running a conduit, you would run the conduit, and then you would pull the cable through the conduit. Expensive. So this precludes the need for a separate conduit system. And this is a very mature cable design. In terms of deployment, we can see that cable in a uh, basically in the structural steel, tying it off to the structural steel. Very robust cable. Uh, I won't say it's forklift resistant, but it's a very crush resistant cable. One of the options that we've recently come up with is a dielectric armored cable. So this is a crush resistant dielectric armor. The beauty of this system is no grounding and bonding. Now, those previous interlock armored cables, you have to ground and bond them because it is a metallic element. The beauty of this is 
lighter, smaller bend radius. You see the bend radius on these cables up here? Very large. So I can, I can put this in a smaller uh, bend. Uh, you can put it on J-hooks. You don't have to have a separate pathway because the conduit is on the cable pre-installed, single pass. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, the other application area I wanted to speak to was device level ring. And this is really 10100 Ethernet, so this is down near the control uh, layer. So here we have a fiber ring. Uh, and the one thing I wanted to talk about this new fiber type is a, it's, we're calling it electrician friendly. It's a really for direct attach fiber where you would put the connectors on uh, directly onto the fiber. Uh, and then no structured cabling, no panels, uh, no extra connectors in the channel. Um, so what we have is a, and as you recall from the previous slides, the fibers were 50, 125, uh, 62 and a half, 125. This is what I would call a fat fiber. The one on the bottom is the one we're talking about. It's a 50, 200, 230, or a 60, 62 and a half, 200, 230, so it's a fat fiber, easy to handle. The magic in this fiber is in the 230. It's a um, very, very tough coating that makes it a very, uh, very tough fiber, very difficult to break. So the beauty of these fiber cables, when you put that fiber in a fiber cable, is that again, this cable as a, con as a control layer cable going between control panels, can live without a conduit system, without a separate pathway, without extra armoring, because it is such a tough fiber. And it does provide 10100 and 1 gig capability. As an example, 10100, you can go two kilometers with this particular type of fiber. Very briefly, uh, this is a fairly new connector system to the market. It's a uh, no Kevlar cable. Typically in these cables there are Kevlars as strength members. What happens with this connector is we crimp directly onto the fiber. This is a very tough uh, fiber. It enables crimping directly onto the fiber. And what we do is we, I can show you really quickly here, is we crimp onto the fiber with the connector. Um, and the step five and six there, it's basically you insert it into a tool. There's fiber sticking out of the nose of the connector, and the fiber is cleaved at the nose. So what you're looking at there is something that's like a uh, F connector, a coax connector, in terms of termination. No esoteric potting and polishing of connectors in the field. This is a this is a basically a half minute termination. So it's really geared towards those device level rings, linear buses where I have embedded switching and no structured cabling. Really an electrician can terminate this in the field. So real world, real world considerations, how do I select my cable? Now we have in TIA 1005, we have this MICE table. And we talked about some rugged cables, but what, how do I select a cable? So there's a mice table. This is in TIA 1005. And we, proceeding from left to right, we talk about environmental severity. Office environment, very benign. Industrial, very harsh. So mice is mechanical, ingress, uh, climactic, chemical, electro, electromagnetic. Um, so we may have water ingress. So in this case, we might need a cable that is gel filled and water blocked, uh, mechanical. Uh, we might have some radical bends of the fiber. Therefore, we would have you know, this PCF fiber, which is very robust and very tough against bending. Uh, electromagnetic, this is why we would choose fiber, because fiber solutions are typically uh, benign against electromagnetic interference. So very important to select the type of cable based on the MICE criteria. And I've just created a snapshot of different cables here. And these are indoor fibers for the most part. So I have four different types here. Indoor fiber distribution, those are the ones up at the top. Interlocking armor, 
Uh, that's where the, the cable really has to protect itself, and there's no separate pathway. Uh, the first ones, the indoor fiber distributions, would have to, have to be laid in a pathway or pulled through a conduit. Uh, Indoor-outdoor polymer clad fiber, this is the tough fiber that we talked about that has the electrician-friendly crimp-on connector, and it's really meant for node-to-node -node applications, control panel to control panel. And then this new uh, indoor dielectric armored fiber, which would be a direct replacement for the indoor interlock armor. Lighter, smaller bend radius, no grounding and bonding. Wanted to finish up with cable plant validation because ultimately, in, as Panduit, to get a warranty, we require permanent link qualification. So this is typically done for fiber cable plant with a light source and a power meter. There are many manufacturers of these out there. Um, the, the TIA 568 sets the expectations on backbone and horizontal cabling. Um, these meters are typically highly automated uh, and will be uh, will calculate the length, the length based on a TDR measurement. Uh, they will set the expectation on the cable plant. So the TIA 568 limits are typically built into these units. Fiber troubleshooters, because no installation is perfect, um, these are typically TDRs, time domain reflectometers, that will highlight reflective events along the cable and point to problem areas. Inspection and cleaning, very important, especially with connectors. Uh, if you take a port off of a transceiver or off of a connector, it should be cleaned and in some cases inspected and then cleaned. That's all I had today and uh, we're going to talk about some of the, um, I'm going to hand it over to Mark, and he's going to point towards uh, the exit interview, uh, some of the, how do you submit questions and so forth. So, Mark. Thanks, Robert. That was a great presentation, very informative. Say, everybody, please hang on the line here, because this is the part of the webcast where we take your questions. So stay with us, uh, even if you're watching the archive, because the Q&A is very educational and it's all included in the archive. Uh, for those watching live, type your questions for today's presenter in the Ask a Question box right on your screen. As a reminder, if you're on Twitter, you can tweet your questions to us by using the hashtag Reliable Fiber Optic Network. We will get to as many questions as we can during the hour. Uh, questions will be answered verbally during the Q&A session, and within a few days, the presentation and the Q&A will be available for your on-demand viewing. If you're registered, we'll send you an email when that's ready so you can share it with your uh, friends and colleagues. You can also access the webcast via the Control Engineering homepage. After the Q&A session, please stay with us for a brief but very instructive fiber polymer termination demonstration video. It's very cool. Now, uh, on to our, our questions. Oh, here's the, the resource page, too, that Robert talked about with a, a lot of great links uh, to good information. Okay, now we'll proceed with the, the Q&A. Please continue to submit your questions while we're working through these. Uh, Robert, here's a, a first question. Uh, please discuss the uh, special expertise required to terminate and connectorize a fiber optic cable. It used to be very complicated. Yeah, I've been in the fiber industry for a number of years, and uh, there's been many fiber connector systems that have been out there. That, I mean, we started with pot polish style connectors where you injected adhesive into the connectors and, and polished in the field. It was kind of arts and crafts. We've gone to uh, the systems that I showed today um, where it's basically a crimp-on style connector and plug it into a tool and pull a trigger. Uh, really not very craft sensitive, very, very short learning curve. So we've gone from the esoteric to these really, really what I'm calling uh, electrician friendly uh, connector systems today. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, here's another question. How are the grounding and bonding 
uh, best practices affected when using a mix of fiber and copper interconnection? I know grounding is a huge issue among our readers. Yeah, mo most people don't realize that uh, we have a lot of customers that use these armored cable systems. Um, most people don't realize that uh, grounding and bonding is important, but it's espoused by standards for uh, backbone cabling, as an example. Even though it's fiber, it has a metallic conduit. The conduit must be grounded. And as I mentioned earlier, EMI, as an example, is one of the things you want to kill with grounding. Fiber is impervious to EMI but transceivers are not. So very noisy environments, um, higher speed transceivers in particular beyond one gig are somewhat susceptible to uh, EMI. Great, thank you. Um, do I have to buy a fiber optic transceiver, transceiver for uplinks or do they come with the Stratix switch? I believe that these are uh, included as kits, but you can order them separately. I know Rockwell has uh, separate, uh, as do most other switch manufacturers, have separate orderable items because these things are, uh, they have a lifetime. Uh, it's probably hundreds of thousands of hours, uh, but they have a lifetime. And uh, the beauty of the modular approach on a switch in particular, because we do have switches with switch ports that are modular. So it's a pay-as-you-grow uh, model. So you don't have to have uh, a fully populated switch from day one. You can grow into the capability of the switch and not have to buy uh, transceivers if you're not using them. Great, thanks. Let's see. Um, is uh, LC the only crimp on connector type, or are there others? No, there's, there's a uh, long and storied history of uh, fiber connectors that are crimp on. Um, there's a lot of field bus style connectors, uh, the versatile link connector as an example, um, T toss link connectors for uh, some Japanese uh, industrial automation controls uh, that are crimp on and quick terminating. Plastic optical fiber, uh, crimp, on ter uh, crimp on termination. Uh, ST connectors. Uh, there are some SC solutions. So no, the, the, in terms of rapid termination, this particular connector doesn't own the market. Great, thanks. Uh, effects on fiber optic cable on kinking and also folding if the cable is too long. I know you, you showed that slide with the loops and talked about the tighter radius. Yeah, the, the, there is, unfortunately, there are fiber manufacturers out there that have produced what they call bend insensitive fiber. And it's a great technology, but it, it, it gives a confusing message to users. Uh, it's not bend insensitive mechanically. It is bend insensitive optically. So the rules of uh, cabling practice in terms of bending, uh, typically we talk about 10x the cable diameter uh, or 20x the cable diameter. 10x would be uh, in situ, uh, in place, and 20x would be during installation where you have installation loads on the cable. So those, those rules are pretty, those are rules of thumb. 10x uh, in situ and 20x during installation of the diameter of the cable. Good. Um, when, when should one use patch panels in a project? Are there mini patch panels for small fiber connection points? How, how does that work? Yeah. I, um, in general, from what we've seen in, in this um, market, in the industrial market, um, the patch panel is not always required or valued. Um, if I have an industrial automation control panel where there are no changes in the panel, as an example, um, I would recommend, and I think a lot of people are going to do direct attach. You know, the, the connector will be terminated and plugged into the electronics. I would say that a high-value link, high-value link being a fiber backbone, 
where I'm going out to a TE, as an example, that serves out many, like an island of automation. Uh, a high-value link that might be reconfigured inside of a TE, patched inside of a TE, uh, that would be a good application for patching. And I did show earlier a DIN rail mounted uh, patch facility where you can take that backbone cabling in and you've got a patch facility for all the fibers uh, on the panel of, of, that, uh, of that enclosure. Good, here's a, a follow-up question to a prior one. It's a talk a little bit more about LC versus SC and ST type connectors. Okay, uh, ST connectors, uh, straight tip connector, been around since the uh, mid 80s. Uh, started life as a, a telecoms connector. Um, SC connector, subscriber connector, is a Japanese connector that came out of NTT. Very popular connector through the 90s and even today. Um, LC connector, what, what's happened is that anything that's above, and it's the lucent connector or little connector, anything that's above a gig, a gigabit per second, uh, pretty much you're going to see an LC connector on the transceiver. Uh, there's a rare, ex rare, rare exceptions to that rule. So it's really um, the, the transceiver that dictates the connector system. As far as reliability, one versus the other, uh, I would say that the SC connector is probably the most robust of the three. The ST is not, uh, you can pull on the tail of the connector and demount it. Uh, both the LC and the SC are what they call non-optical disconnect. So when you pull on the cable, you don't demate the connector. Good. Here's a, a listener asking, uh, which of the resource links provides the fiber optic infrastructure application guide? Um, it's uh, go to www.panduit.com backslash IA, and I believe you'll find it there. That's the guide that has a lot of this content in there, reference architectures and practices and so forth. And I believe it's about a 70-page guide. It's a really good read. Is there a maximum length and force allowed for pulling specification on cables going through an underground duct? Yeah, one of the things that you've got to look for is, based on the cable design, there will be uh, spec sheets and practices based on uh, the design of the cable, a stranded cable versus a unit tube cable versus an interconnect cable. And what I would do is look towards the manufacturer's data sheets, and, and generally they'll give you a maximum pulling force, uh, you know, 100 pounds, 200 pounds. It's really a function of the cable design, uh, how many fibers are in there, uh, and generally, there will be practices depending on the deployment. If it's a conduit pole, if it's an aerial installation, if it's direct burial, if it's a tray, um, they will give that guidance. We have that, those guidance in the form of best practices out on the Panduit website. Um, could you address termination or patch panel selection? Uh, cabinets appear large for what's in them. Is there a less intrusive uh, way to, to do that? I mean, there are, um, there are uh, patching facilities where, uh, I mean, you, you could, uh, there's not a lot of real estate uh, in, um, in, those, in those boxes for cable management in particular. There are standards on the minimum length of patch cords so you do, especially on the copper side for one gig, you do have to manage those patch cords. Um, you do have to store slack of the patch cords uh, on the fiber side. You can't basically make right angles with the cable. So it appears as though there's a lot of wasted space, but it is, um, it, it is to protect the fiber and to protect the copper. Great. Thanks very much, Robert. I, I
appreciate. Um, and I appreciate everybody's uh, Q and A's. Thanks to our great speaker, Robert Reed, for sharing his time and expertise for our webcast today. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to the sponsor, Panduit, for generous support of today's webcast. Uh, hang on, though, because in just a moment we'll play a short fiber optic demo video from the, the sponsor. And after that uh, special demo, uh, we'll, we'll pause um, uh, about 20 seconds to compensate for various connection speeds. Uh, but leave your browser open because a, an exit survey will uh, appear, and that will help us prepare for future webcasts. Uh, on behalf of CFE Media and Control Engineering, uh, we'd like to uh, thank you for attending today's webcast, Copyright 2013 CFE Media. And now uh, here's the special fiber optic video presentation uh, followed by the survey, so please stay with us. Today we're going to do a field termination with the Panduit LC PCF connector. I've pre-terminated one end and it's plugged into the ETAP. I'm going to take my strip tool. I've got a gauge mark marked on the jacket itself. I'm going to take off the jacket in two passes. So what I've done here is remove the jacket material from the PCF cable. It's a zip style cable. So the next step is I want to remove the primary coating off of the cable. So to do that, I'm going to take a little bit of a finger stretch with my fingers just to delaminate the primary coating from the PCF fiber. I'm taking my microstrip tool to take off the primary coating and inserting the fiber into the microstrip. I'm going to use typically two passes. Now I have taken off the primary coating. My next step is to mount the back shell of the connector. I have preloaded the front end of the connector with the crimp tool, and I'm going to crimp it directly onto the cable. There's no Kevlar in this termination, so I'm using the strength of the glass as a strength member, instead of Kevlar like a traditional cable. Here I'm inserting the fiber into the connector, and I'm crimping it. In this step, I'm going to perform the cleaving operation. This will remove the fiber from the front of the connector, basically inserting the connector into the tool and actuating the tool by using a nice, even pressure. This finishes the termination.